Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this amazing talk that we're going to have tonight from the David who takes on Goliath every day. It was Amanda Harcourt's brilliant idea to ask Max Schrems. I don't want to say any more because you've come really to listen to Amanda's introduction and above all to Max. Amanda. Thank you, Sir Robin. Um, in the world of rock and roll, a few, very few artists are afforded the accolade of being identified by one single word. Cher, Jagger, Rihanna, Drake. It's not particularly common in the law, except maybe Denning or Laddie. Well, in my book tonight, Privacy David to Facebook's Goliath deserves such a solo honorific. In the five years in which the Institute of Brand and Innovation Law here at UCL has been hosting the, its privacy and data events, tonight's guest has been an inspiring pres presence. With his achievements hovering over us, we've explored the effects of surveillance capitalism upon our young people, upon society, and a real concern for the academic world, the effect of their businesses upon the nature of debate. Tonight's guest should also be saluted for carrying his legal successes over into a vital organization. The somewhat cheekily named None of Your Business is becoming an important European enforcement platform. It works on targeted and strategic litigation, very sensibly collaborating with other sympathetic organizations and thereby it prevents duplication of effort. None of Your Business educates people about their privacy rights emphasizing their value in the modern world. I would urge all of you who share our guests' concerns to find the website noyb.eu and to make a donation. In any event, we'll be emailing all of you after uh, tonight's event a link so that you can. This man's something of a personal hero of mine, so it's a genuine pleasure to welcome him tonight. So lords, ladies and gentlemen, I now will hand over to I really want to say Shrems. Welcome to UCL, Max Shrems. Hey, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, yeah, so basically I was asked to talk about the Shrems 2 litigation. I hope you can all see the screen share. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, let's start with the background. So basically the background of the whole um, case was the Snowden slides. Um, that's oftentimes a bit for, forgotten that um, there were these wonderful slides. You, they're by now more than 10 years old, as you can see by the graphics, even though these graphics were even terrible 10 years ago. Um, and basically the system of surveillance that was described in these, in these slides were two things. The first thing was what they call upstream, which is collection of the data at the backbone of the internet. So international hubs, international wires, um, whenever the um, internet backbone basically lands in the US, um, situations like that. Um, the upstream collection was, was oftentimes done in coordination with US um, telecom provider, backbone providers, et cetera. There is um, a separate type of surveillance um, that was back then called PRISM is now called downstream. So um, if I use these two words, they're basically the same because um, this was just rebranded at some point. And the big benefit of that is that at um, the that this collection happens at the big internet providers. So while data may be encrypted end to end, um, it usually rests unencrypted with these companies, or at least in a way that the encryption keys are with these companies. So um, the big benefit is that you don't have to crack some, some encryption, that you don't have to overcome a lot of the technical um, measures that we have, because these companies um, basically have the keys anyways, and you can, under US law, force them to provide these keys. So um, a lot of the um, options that you usually have to protect against um, espionage or, or other types of surveillance um, are simply not there once you're in the uh, prism world. What was super interesting with these slides was that for the first time, we kind of understood a bit better how all of this actually works, um, who is actually participating in that surveillance, and um, that we also had these logos basically on top of the slides here. 
Um, and at the time, it was unveiled that there is these, this, what you can see in the slide here, an FBI D DITU, which is this direct interception unit. Um, they basically placed technical, um, the technical options to really get that data. Um, it then goes down through tons of different elements. You can see them on the right. Um, I personally have, I think, read about all of them at some point, but even forgotten what they really do. And they basically just take the data stream and strip out different information that can be used further. Um, long story short, what we have here is kind of a private public partnership for surveillance. Um, it's rather simple uh, for the US authority to, um, to say, instead of us hacking into each phone of the world, we basically just have to hack into um, Apple and Google and thereby be in every phone of the world <laughs> that is used today. So um, at the time we had this list here, of the prison providers, the companies that were signed up. You can see that they have these um, numbers. So for example, P1 was Microsoft, P2 Yahoo, and so on. And um, you even can see in these slides that there has to be some kind of um, real-time um, surveillance because for example, F um, for the code stands for voice over IP. So usually kind of real-time communication, so not just stored communication, but also real-time communication that can be intercepted somehow with the system. Um, again, a lot of these things are um, the slides from 10 years ago. You can see even with the companies that are listed here that some of them don't even exist anymore today, that a lot of the technology that's uh, mentioned here is probably not that relevant anymore today. Um, and um, I think that's extremely important to highlight because a lot of the surveillance has moved on. So for example, what you can see in these slides um, is a company like Amazon Web Services, which is by today one of the biggest cloud providers, but it's not on these slides. Reason being that at the time, Amazon was just not a big thing in this space. So um, that's one of the big um, things to stress when we look at these, uh, at these files and these, these details, that a lot of that is really historic. So I think they're a good explanation of how the law can be applied. The law hasn't changed since then much. Um, but we shouldn't kind of think that that's all they do. We should basically see that as a historic artifact um, and think about how this is probably going to be used today. One good example is Amazon. So for example, Amazon is not on any of these lists um, because for example, here the timeline of when they were signing up um, ends in 2012, basically. Um, but Amazon um, is by now even having a transparency report where they say that they do provide all of this information under that uh, system. So um, I think everything we know about these um, Snowden disclosures are, are to a large extent historic and, and just an explanation of how this law can be used. Um, if we now look at the US law, that's basically the, the core law that we're dealing with. And anybody that knows about US surveillance law will probably now scream about the simplification that um, this slide represents. But in a very, very simple term, uh, FISA 702, which is um, also 50 US code um, 1881A, it's oftentimes a bit confusing from a European side because this law just has two numbers. Uh, the one is the Amendment Act and the other one is kind of the number in the final code of the US. Um, has a couple of very simple elements. The law itself is I think about 14 pages long and very, very complex and referring to each other up and down. But if you actually go through the whole law, it's very interesting because um, a lot of the elements that seem to be protection kind of fall away when you kind of connect the, the dots with each other. It, it sounds very protective if you say there are 14 pages of text to govern surveillance. Um, but in reality, there is only very little crucial elements in this law. The first one is that you need an electronic communication service provider. Um, that's a word that's really crucial for anybody that wants to understand the law a little bit better than just saying US law is terrible. Um, and I'm going to get back to that to that word a couple of times, so stick with me and, and keep it in your head. Um, electronic communication service providers are defined in US law, and it's basically all the telecom companies, it's the um, cloud companies, all of these kind of communication companies. Um, that also means that not every US recipient of data falls under the surveillance law. So let's say um, the Austrian Steelworks bought a steel mill in, in Texas that steel mill is not an electronic communication service provider. So it doesn't fall under that surveillance law. So for example, if our 
Austrian steel mill sends data to their Texas steel mill, there's not really any problem with these surveillance laws here. So um, I think that's important to, to keep in mind um, that um, this law is not every US recipient, it's certain recipients. The second thing you need is um, so-called foreign intelligence information. And that is a very, very broad term. So you don't need a suspect, you don't need probable cause, you don't need a crime, you don't need any of that. You need foreign intelligence information. So just, um, it's also defined in law, it's, it's terrorism, it's um, counterintelligence, it's blah, blah, blah. Um, but the broadest term that's in the definition um, is um, the uh, it's information that is relevant to the foreign conduct of the United States, which is an extremely broad term, <laughs> and basically anything that the U.S. could possibly be interested in in a foreign country is such foreign intelligence information. So it sounds very kind of fancy, but it's actually a very, very broad term. And um, the U.S. usually highlights terrorism and things where we're on the same page, um, but a typical thing for that is just intelligence about our governments, intelligence about the European Union, um, intelligence about diplomatic needs, um, stuff like that. Or um, also from an Austrian perspective, we're typically a neutral country. We usually pretend that we don't have any views on anything. Um, and so, for example, we have a lot of trade usually with Russia, with Iran, with typically countries that are on embargo lists of the US. So um, trading like that, that, for example, from a European perspective could be OK, even the Europeans disagree on that, um, could be a potential um, element that is of interest for um, the US under this foreign intelligence information prong. And I think that's especially interesting if we think about trade deals, about negotiations, that um, we know that there was the NSA in the, in the Belgian um, telecom uh, networks to spy on, on, on Brussels. So in typically in these situations, we fall in this foreign intelligence information situation that is um, dependent on the industry sector, a, a very crucial topic. If you're, let's say in oil or in, I don't know, part of Airbus or something like that, um, you may be really worried about that, not for privacy reasons, but for intelligence reasons. Um, so I think that's an important part to, to add to the debate here. Um, then again, in very simplified terms, there is a so-called certification for one year, and that is where this FISA court comes into play. Um, so there is a foreign intelligence surveillance court, and the U.S. usually upholds 100 times that it is all court-reviewed. But what this certification does is that it um, kind of allows a whole surveillance process for one year. So they basically approve something like the upstream program on a very high level to be conducted for one year. There is never an individual case reviewed by a judge. There is never an individual even reason for surveillance um, reviewed. It's the overall pro program that's reviewed. And that is a paper review. It's not a on-premises review in any way. It basically reviews, for example, these minimization and targeting procedures that are, that are meant to filter out Americans. And the reason for that is rather simple. All of this would be a violation of the US Constitution if it would be done on American citizens or permanent residents called US persons. Um, the only reason why all of that is legal under US law is because Pfizer filters out anybody that has constitutional protections in the US, which is these US persons, by applying this minimization and targeting procedure. So the idea is if we basically separate the data between people that have fundamental rights under US doctrine and people that are fair game anyways and don't have any fundamental rights, then we can use this data that of people that doesn't have any rights and just do with it whatever we want to do. And um, that is fundamentally how FISA is set up and how it's work, how it works. Um, then basically what happens is that a service provider um, gets a so-called directive and the directive is not specified further it says that basically that directive includes that everything has to be secret and that um, it directs the company to uh, provide the assistance necessary to conduct the, the, the surveillance so generally we assume right now that there is basically an api that these companies open up to be able to pull the data out of the system However, that's not defined in the law. Um, so we can only say, for example, if you want to listen to voice over IP, 
There is no way that you're going to have paper traces being sent back and forth between Silicon Valley and the NSA headquarters. Um, it's probably going to be a technical interface to do that. Um, but basically, that topic is so far um, not discussed. So um, that's basically the law in, ver again, very simple terms. But I think it kind of explains the levels of protection that you have here. Um, now, if we switch over to European law, um, the general rule in Europe is that there is an export prohibition. So basically, personal data may not leave the European economic area, uh, period. That's kind of the default rule, which is a very extreme rule. It's basically an export prohibition um, that we usually have for weapons, for you know, very <laughs> important goods. But um, it's kind of necessary to keep up the European privacy levels that the data actually stays in that area where it's protected. Because if you just take protected data, move it to name a country somewhere in the world where there's no data protection, you would be able to just remove the data from the protected sphere. So you need kind of that expert control to make sure that it stays within the bubble of, of right now what the GDPR is. It used to be a directive before. Now, because that's obviously not how anything works in real life, there is so-called derogation. So there are derogations for, again, in very simple terms, what I would now call necessary transfers. You can read the details in Article 49. Necessary transfers is a bit kind of a simplification, but it kind of gives you the idea of what, what Article 49 does. And the idea is that if you actually have to send an email to the US or you book a hotel in North Korea, your data has to go there. Otherwise, you're not going to have a hotel room in North Korea, even though North Korea is probably not anything that we would accept as, as a, a country that has human rights and so on. Um, but these derogations are foreseen. So that's possible generally. The big problem in reality is nothing of, of what I've talked about. The big problem in reality is outsourcing. So situations where we send data abroad because it's cheaper, easier, nicer product, something else, but it's not technically crucially necessary to send it abroad. Um, so for example, if I send a message to a friend of mine with on let's say Facebook that are both in Vienna, there's technically no reasons why that message would even have to leave Vienna itself. <laughs> um, it's just right now the technical setup that it goes from here to Frankfurt to somewhere in the US to some other service in the US back to somewhere back in Frankfurt and then to my friend's phone, even though we may sit in the, in the same room. So it's kind of an outsourcing situation uh, for various reasons that are not technically necessary, if, if you want to call it that way. And for these outsourcing situations, basically the GDPR foresees situations where we expand the GDPR rules to non-EU countries. So the whole idea is that um, outsourcing is OK if you send it to a third territory that actually follows your same rules as in the European Union. So you basically have this European privacy bubble and you just try to expand it to wherever your data goes and, and have the bubble go with the data. That's kind of the, the way to describe it. And the simplest type of that is adequacy. Um, there are standard contractual clauses that I'm going to talk about mostly today and binding corporate rules that I'm not going to talk about because in reality, it just doesn't have a big role. Um, but if you look at adequacy, if you think about Switzerland, it's rather simple. We have the GDPR. In Switzerland, there is a Data Protection Act, which is more or less modeled after the GDPR system. So we basically have a joint privacy bubble, if you want to call it that way. And there is no reason why a European company and the Swiss company wouldn't be able to exchange data if more or less the protection is the same anyways. Um, that's very different in the US. If you look at the US generally, there is no Data Protection Act. Um, so you don't have that basis in law where you can say you can just send the data back and forth because we have the same law anyways. But you can basically expand it contractually. So you say, okay, this US company on the right doesn't have a duty under American law to um, actually have data protection, but we expand it through a contractual arrangement. So we basically have this US company sign a contract saying, hereby I very much pledge to follow European privacy standards. Um, and that is what we did with the standard contractual clauses, the SECs, what we did with Privacy Shield, Safe Harbor as well, and BCRs as well. They're all contractual instruments where they um, kind of self-certify um, self that they follow these rules independent of the law of that country. And that works well if you have a country that basically has a legal vacuum in that area, just a country that simply doesn't have any rules on privacy. You can fill that vacuum through a contract that 
kind of works, it's, it's, it's technically not a problem. The big problem with the US is a different one, is it's not just a vacuum, but it has, for example, 702 Pfizer as a surveillance law. So this company gets basically, this American company on the right, gets into a conflict. On the one side, European law says you have to have privacy, but American law dictates that you have to have surveillance. And that just has to kind of get to a very basic conflict. And if you keep any slide of, of, of today's presentation in your head, please make it this slide, because all the debates we have about different instruments and different types of transfers, it always boils down to a very high level clash. It's basically US law saying surveillance, Amer European law saying privacy, and these two trains just collide. And what's I think just on a very basic level important, this is a matter of having too much law. We have two jurisdictions that regulate the same subject matter in the exact opposite way. And so adding an additional element between these two trains that collide just usually makes this, these two trains and the element clash. So it's a bit like having two high-speed trains clash and then the commission comes around and say, oh, we could put another Band-Aid in between and call it privacy shield. So you now have two trains colliding plus a Band-Aid that's killed and it doesn't really get you anywhere. And I think that is kind of the gist of the litigation of the last 10 years is you can't, you can't kind of, it's, it's the opposite of a vacuum. It's just too much law and you can't fix that problem on, by adding more law in between. It's just gonna make more law clash. And that's, I think on a very fundamental level, the problem that, that the last years have shown. Now, if we go a bit more into detail and, and we leave that very high level part, um, our case was basically built this, this little way that I was that little smiley down here in Austria. I technically had a contract with Facebook Ireland because for tax avoidance reasons, all of these companies are either in Ireland or Luxembourg or the Netherlands. Um, and then my data basically goes to Facebook Inc. in the US. Um, previously about under the SEC's privacy shield, be it the BCRs, it doesn't really matter. In reality, my data is, is under surveillance twice at least. Um, first under upstream during the transit on the backbone and then under PRISM when it has arrived in the US. Now upstream is not the big problem probably for Facebook because usually that data is encrypted somehow. So it's not that realistic that that, that data is actually under surveillance even though you can usually break that encryption as well. But let's pretend for the sake of the argument that, that that's not possible then basically the bigger problem is PRISM. Both of them operate under FISA that I've already explained, um, but they also operate under 12333. 12333 is from a European perspective, very interesting um, because um, it's an executive order. It's not a law and there is no basis in law for it. So an executive order under US law is basically an order by the president. And under the US constitution, the president has the inherent power to just order surveillance abroad. It doesn't need a legal basis. It doesn't need any kind of Congress to tell him that he's allowed to do that. He simply has that power under the US Constitution. So the US president can just pass an executive order and say, hereby everybody's under surveillance that's in, I don't know, Eritrea. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. And um, EO 12333 gives you some rules, but basically the rules are again, don't do that against American citizens. Because again, for Americans, the Fourth Amendment would still apply and limit the options under the executive order. There is additional executive orders that are called in, in, in the one that we are dealing with PPD 28. Um, each president calls them a bit different. PPD was how Obama called them. And the interesting thing about these executive orders is not all of them have to be public. So PPD 28 is public. It limits certain types of surveillance. But there are other PPDs that are not public. Um, so it could well be that by now there is a Trump PPD, however you want to call it, that has overwritten PPD 28, and we all just don't know it. <laughs> and so it's very hard to navigate that part of law because theoretically it's possible that there is secret law that is the law that's on the books is not even applicable anymore. And uh, one crucial thing for these executive orders is they don't have they don't create third party rights. So it's an internal order among the executive. So as a citizen, you can actually, or as a foreigner, you cannot rely on them or, or sue the US government for non-compliance with these, with these instruments because they're simply an internal order by the president. It's basically the president telling the guy that pushes the button, do this or don't do that. Um, but it's not something you as a person can rely on. Um, yeah, so basically that's kind of the background story. 
So the first round was what is now called TREMS-1. Um, I usually call it the safe harbor litigation because it's super weird to have cases in your name. Um, but apparently that's today's world is about faces and people and, and, and you know, uh, and yay and nay for individuals. So I guess I'm that privacy clown that is now um, standing for these transfer issues in the good and the bad. So some think you're here or the other ones think you're killing the internet. Um, I usually rather want to talk about the facts of it, um, but it becomes a bit of a facial thing then. So basically with all of that story, we went to the Irish Data Protection Commissioner because um, at the time they regulated Facebook. And um, the then commissioner, Billy Hawks, was the commissioner at the time, um, came outside his little house in Port Arlington, which is a 5,000 inhabitant place about an hour outside of Dublin, where he had his 20 employees and uh, went on national radio in Ireland, RTE, and um, basically said, I don't think it will come as much of a surprise that in fact, US intelligence services do have access from US companies. And um, he then closed the case um, with this wonderful letter. When we ask what, you know, why they closed this case when they kind of acknowledged that there is this surveillance problem. And as always in Ireland, they haven't really told you why they closed the case. And they said, we reserve the right to seek to rely on section 101A of the Irish Act, which is saying that they think that they may investigate any case, even though the law so says that they shall investigate any complaint. So they basically say the may overrides the shall in the law. Um, then they said, I, or 101BI, which is that my complaint would be frivolous and vexatious, and therefore it's denied, or a combination thereof, or indeed any other relevant legal basis. So if you go to a regulator that is meant to um, enforce your fundamental rights in Europe, um, that is usually how they fuck with you. Um, there's really no other word you can use for it. Um, because after 10 years experience with the Irish uh, regulator, they simply try every trick in the book to get rid of a complainant. And um, that is, um, I think for many people also at our, at our office, sometimes the most frustrating part of their life. I personally just don't care about it anymore. I just see it as a game. But if you really think that they're, um, official job would be to enforce these things and do actually the stuff that I've done after all. <laughs> um, you, you oftentimes wonder about the reactions that you have there. So um, being a little Austrian and not really taking authority that seriously, um, we went to the Irish High Court and filed a judicial review on all of that. I personally, being from a country that is not common law, I, I had no clue what I got into with all of this um, because um, the common law system is, is really in these things a, a different ball game of what we are used to oftentimes. Um, I'm going to shorten this a lot, but basically we got to the court of justice on the question if this um, safe harbor system that, um, that we thought Facebook was using is in violation of the fundamental rights of the European Union because basically the European Commission has accepted US law as being adequate. And the question was, is that possible given the fundamental rights in the European Union? Now in EU law, we usually have a proportionality test. You have these four elements you go through and in the last element, it's the latest part where you all have to disagree about the answer. Um, and we usually have cases where the court of justice says something was disproportionate, so for example, data retention in Europe. However, in this case, we argued that there is a violation of the essence of a fundamental right. We never thought that we're going to win this. <laughs> and you just usually, you know, if you go to court, you oftentimes ask for 150% to make sure you get your 100%. And we basically argued that according to the case law of the Court of Justice, this would have to be a violation of the essence. Um, for the non-lawyers, the violation of the essence is extremely interesting because it means that you do not have to even go into proportionality tests. So you basically have a violation of a fundamental right that is so extreme and so absurd that the court doesn't even have to see if that could be proportionate. The only thing where we have that set in law is for torture. So basically torture, there is never a proportionality test. It's always illegal. Um, and that's a bit comparable to what the essence is usually for under, other fundamental rights. So you never get that far. In reality, you just never hit the essence. And it was interesting that the Court of Justice took this case and said, actually, there's a violation of the essence of your fundamental right to privacy and your fundamental right to access to justice. So we had a very um, strong ruling from the Court of Justice there.
there were three other findings that are extremely interesting. Uh, first of all, that um, the third country has to um, be essentially equivalent in the protection than, than the European Union, which is um, historically interesting because uh, that was the original wording, wording in the 90s of the proposal of the law, said a third country had to be essentially equivalent. That was lobbied out and replaced by adequate. And we all know that adequate means everything and nothing. <laughs> so basically what the Court of Justice did, it basically lobbied back into the law, the original meaning <laughs> of the writers of the law, um, which was kind of interesting how the Court of Justice dealt with that. They also said that they have to be effective detection and supervision mechanisms. And there has to be legal redress in line with Article 49 of the char uh, 47 of the Charter. So basically a proper court to go to. What's extremely interesting is this is a higher stand standard that we have in many member states. If you look at the effective detection and supervision mechanisms, our data protection authorities in Europe are probably in many cases not effective at all in doing their job. Um, we usually don't have legal redress in line with Article 49 for surveillance cases. If I'm an Austrian and I want to complain about German surveillance, there is no court to go to in Germany right now. And that was something that the US has rightfully pointed out is that the Court of Justice asked for very high standards here that not even the European member states are able to comply with. The background for that is that at least according to one theory, um, the member states um, have an, a total exemption that's debated um, for national security. So there is an argument that basically um, if you have a national security case, these fundamental rights do not apply to you as a member state. The interesting thing is that the treaties exempt the national security of a member state. Now, this means that basically for the US, they don't fall under that exemption because US security is not a national security of a member state, but of a third state. While Germany could, or France could argue that and say our national security is exempt from EU law and this review because it's a national security of a member state. The only ones that are super interested in that is obviously the UK because it is not a member state anymore. So while the UK could previously argue that any kind of surveillance that the UK does falls under that exemption in Article 4 of the treaty, it may not fall under that exemption anymore today. Um, so that's a side topic on, on how this connects to the, the European member states. What came out of that um, judgment is basically two prongs. So first of all, you have to have this essential equivalence with the GDPR, so one hurdle to get over. Um, but you also have to be fully compliant with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And that is something that especially the, the US lawyers or the industry lawyers um, had a hard time to understand or didn't want to understand. You got to think that in the legal bubble, basically all the money is on the side of killing this case. So tons of theories are floated and produced on why all of this should not be understood as the court of justice has said it. And one of the theories was basically that that second hurdle didn't exist. So basically they said, as long as we're somehow equivalent with the GDPR, we're all good. And that was the narrative that the US has picked up in negotiations as well. And basically said, as long as we're as good as the worst EU member state, we're good enough. And that is simply not what the judgment said and what we saw in the Schrems II litigation later. What the European Commission has done is that they basically came up with the idea of privacy shield. So what happened in the background is politicians didn't want to accept that judgment and basically said, we want to have a new agreement um, as quickly as possible. Um, that will basically overcome that, that um, safe harbor agreement that was um, struck down in the first litigation. And they came up with this idea of privacy shield. And it was really interesting because privacy shield at the time um, only had what you can see on this screen, which was a name and the logo. So um, we didn't have the text of the agreement that they apparently agreed on. We only had this logo that Jurova, the justice commissioner at the time, ran into the European Parliament and said, that's now the solution. And an American NGO, Epic, has then made a freedom of information request to said, we would also like to see the text of that agreement. And two weeks later, they got an answer by the US government saying um, that this access request is denied because the record that you requested does not exist. So the European Union has basically presented an agreement that factually didn't exist. And the text was only written about a, a month later. And if you looked at the text, the text was more or less a copy paste from uh, Safe Harbor. So there was tiny improvements on the commercial data usage. Um, they were really minimal, a couple of administrative upgrades. And on the government data use, 
it was the first time that they have described that this thing exists, but it hasn't changed anything of the US uh, surveillance. So it just basically said, we described the facts in the US and then come to the conclusion that it's fine, but we haven't really changed anything. The only thing that they added was this ombudsperson as a possibility for redress. I'm just gonna cite a couple of um, elements of that to see how ridiculous it was. Um, so one of the things, for example, was from the official press release of the European Commission, where the European Commission said that US authorities assured that there is no indiscriminate or mass surveillance by national security authorities. So the only thing they said is not they don't do it, but they have assured us that they don't do what they call indiscriminate or mass surveillance, which is very typical wording for these diplomatic circles. It's basically, we don't say they don't do it, we just say they assured us they don't do it. So it's not on us to actually know the facts. <laughs> and secondly, there is a big debate about what is indiscriminate or mass surveillance, because the US has a very different view about what mass surveillance is. So they could simply just say, oh, we had a disagreement about what mass surveillance really means and therefore get out of the problem. Um, if you look at the annexes then, for example, um, there was this annex um, six page four, where they even said that they basically um, use signal intelligence uh, collected in bulk for six purposes. So they say on the one hand in their own decision that there is six cases where there's bulk collection of data, but at the same time, there is no mass surveillance. I don't know how you can square it, but <laughs> that's definitely one thing. And one of the purposes, for example, was just combating transnational criminal threats. So you don't need um, a crime, you just need the threat of a crime. So a Mexican guy walking along the border could potentially throw drugs over the fence, if you stretch it as far as you can, would be a transnational criminal threat because it crosses a border and there's a threat. Um, so this definition even for bulk surveillance is extremely broad. Um, and um, if you then basically um, see these details even further, um, you can find these things that in footnotes where it says bulk and then if you follow the footnote it basically says that um for example bulk surveillance is not bulk surveillance if it's only temporary in bulk and then later drilled down to individuals then it's under the definition of the us not bulk surveillance anymore so we had all this theater in reality that hasn't changed anything and just tried to camouflage all of that um, a wonderful kind of way to describe what politicians have done on that is they basically took us law took this PTV 28 internal guidelines that were classified and all of that was put in a letter by a representative of the US and that letter was then attached to the European decision. So the European Commission has not said we made an assessment on US law and that's the fact, but they said we got a letter certifying that the US is following European fundamental rights. If you think about that, for example, for China, we would never accept that the Chinese government sent us a letter saying that they follow fundamental rights and therefore it's good. <laughs> we would usually not trust the foreign government in making that assessment itself. Um, but for the US, that is what they did. And that allowed the European Commission to say, oh, we have never done anything wrong. It was just in the letters that told us that all of that is fine. A very nice one was also the enforcement mechanism. So basically as a citizen, um, you would have to go to the DPA, your national DPA, then go through the EDB, but let's jump that. And they could have raised the surveillance issue with this ombudsperson at the time. And that ombudsperson would have talked with the internal parties within the US and then gotten back to your DPA. So let's say my Austrian Data Protection Authority uh, would have basically gotten the answer on my, on my prom. An interesting thing is that that um, Privacy Shield Agreement already had a definition of how that answer has to be framed. So first of all, it, they will answer that it has been investigated and that they either complied or remedied the situation, but you don't know if they have always complied with the law or they haven't complied with it, but remedied it. And then further, they would neither confirm nor deny that there was even any kind of surveillance happening. So it's extremely amazing because this system where you basically would always get the same rubber stamp answer, no matter what the reality is or what the case is, um, was seen as a, redress under Article 47 of the Charter, so a fundamental rights um, fair trial. And that was quite amazing for me to, to see how the European Commission has basically given up even the idea of having proper redress. Um, 
And that were the elements, if you went into the privacy shield, why in the end we called all of this lipstick on a pig. I could probably go on for another 20 minutes about all the prompts with privacy shield, but literally they have taken safe harbor, put some lipstick on it and tried to pass it a second time. <laughs> and it's basically a typical political um, situation where an illegal law is just passed again and again because it takes two or three years to annul the law. And until it's annulled, it's seen as, or it has to be treated as, as legitimate. Um, so what the European Commission engaged in is basically just passing and knowingly passing a, a un, unlawful act, um, hoping that it's just not gonna be turned down for the next two or three years. So we were in this kind of ping pong between the court of justice saying that's illegal, the European Commission just passing it again, and politicians in reality just hope that they're not gonna sit on their seat anymore once um, this hits the court of justice again, because then they can basically say it's the, the next justice commissioner that will have to deal with this. And um, we got exactly to that situation because we had the second round called TREMS 2. In this case, um, what was extremely interesting is that the, um, Europe, the, the Irish DPC has started an investigation into the whole matter because the first TREMS 1 litigation was just about them opening a case. So once they had to open the case, they closed the case after about a month again and said that they have like these very fundamental questions about, um, about data transfers and um, they don't want to solve them themselves, but they think they have to go back to the court of justice on all of that. All of that was a huge charade. They could have decided themselves, but what the Irish DPC basically wanted is to kick the ball back to Luxembourg. They said, we're not going to decide about this. Let's find some obscure legal theory why we have to go back to Luxembourg. And the theory was that these standard contractual clauses that Facebook has used um, were actually um, unlawful or somehow problematic, which was nothing that either Facebook or us has ever argued. Um, but by having that charade, they basically were able to get into the courts. What was extremely interesting is here that the DPC was actually litigating against Facebook and me. So I was actually a defendant. It's um, kind of amazing if you go to a regulator, ask for them to enforce your rights, that you're actually then on the defendant's bench and the regulator sues you among, together with, with Facebook in this case to um, get into the courts. Um, that was kind of a technical trick that they did to get into the courts. Um, the whole case then had about 20 solicitors and barristers that were sitting there for about six weeks of hearings in Ireland. Um, I guess for common law, it's normal, but for me, it was extreme that literally every law, every document had to be read out in the court. So we had literally six weeks of just reading things. Um, had about 45,000 pages of documents that were submitted to the court. We had four amicus, so EPIC, a US NGO, the US government, uh, Business Software Alliance, and Digital Europe also joined the bandwagon. So we basically had seven parties in the end. And we still don't have the final bill for all of that, but we expect the costs for this litigation, the France 2 litigation, to be about 10 million euros. And under Irish law, whoever loses the case would be liable for these 10 million euros. So I made sure that there is no um, possibility to enforce any of that in Austria. And I was like, worst case, I'm not gonna have a summer house in Ireland. Um, but it's, it's extremely important to highlight that because the idea is that every citizen can just go into the courts and you know has access to the DPAs for free. The reality is that you may lose your life over a case like that if you lose it. Um, and if you have, I don't know, a judge that probably um, is, 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 is not getting the parts of the case and you may just, you know, for these cases that happen in courts, um, lose your case and lose um, your livelihood. Mm -hmm. What were the core arguments and the Schrems 2 litigation? So basically, again, very simplified, Facebook um, had the view that there is no surveillance in the US that goes beyond EU law so that there's basically no problem. So their theory was, what the US does is terrible, but it's just as bad as what, what the UK is doing. And as the UK is in the EU, we're just as bad as the EU and therefore there is no problem with the equivalence test here. Um, we basically said that the Irish DPC can use article four of the SCC's. Article four allows to stop data transfers in individual cases um, if the national law is not up to the level. So we said, okay, there has to be a targeted solution. We have to look at the individual transfer. We have to look at if that recipient in the US, for example, falls under these surveillance laws. There may be some argument that they have in individual cases why they can overcome that problem, but you have to do this case by case assessment. It first has to be done by the companies, but if the companies don't do it, 
then um, the uh, regulator has to stop the data transfer in that individual case. That is what we call that targeted solution for Pfizer companies. Um, what was extreme is the US basically said that they could not use, uh, the DPC said that they cannot use Article 4. They could never explain why they couldn't use Article 4. Basically, they just said, we don't want to do targeted solutions. We don't want to deal with any of that. So we don't just factually don't use Article 4. And therefore said, because there is no solution, because they don't use the solution in the law, they found that there is a systematic problem and took the view that the SECs as a whole are invalid. So that would mean that you could also not transfer data to South America, to hundreds of other countries anymore. Um, and that's what we call basically the nuclear option. So they basically wanted to invalidate the SECs worldwide. There is no logical reason whatsoever for that argument. The DPC were the only ones that ever pursued that argument. It was absolutely rejected by the Court of Justice. This, the position of the DPC made no legal sense whatsoever. The only sense that it had was that it raised the question of validity. And because the validity question was raised, it had to go to the Court of Justice because the only institution in the European Union that can find a European instrument to be invalid is the Court of Justice. So this whole invalidity drama was a procedural game basically to get to the Court of Justice and kick the ball back down there. Um, and was not really substantiated ever in the whole litigation. Um, and that's very typical for how the Irish DPC operates. It officially has a big drama and a big problem here that is just there to basically kick kick the ball down, uh, pick, kick the, the ball down the, the road or the, the can down the road, however you want to call it. And what was the outcome of that? Basically, on the procedural law, they said that Article 4 is the solution exactly as, as we've put forward and that there has to be individual enforcement on this Pfizer company. So the Court of Justice literally sided 100% with all of our arguments. Um, there was um, the invalidation for the SECs was not relevant anymore because there was this individualized solution, so to say. And they also highlighted that there is a duty of the DPAs to enforce the GDPR, which is a very important part that I think is oftentimes overlooked in this case, because so far a lot of the DPAs still take the view that they have discretion to act or not act, um, and in this case, it was very interesting that the Court of Justice highlighted that they have a duty to enforce the law and not just look the other way. On material law level, there was a slight difference because in fact, referred by the Irish High Court in the second case, there was not, in the first case, they said that there is mass surveillance in the US. And in the second case, they said that there is mass processing. So they basically said, not all the data is further put under surveillance necessarily, but it's at least scanned and made available. And on GDPR, that's called processing. So there is a very slight difference between mass surveillance and mass processing in the facts that were referred to the Court of Justice. And that felt led to a little bit different outcome in the material law because they basically said that US surveillance law is not proportionate anymore. While in Schrems 1, they still said it's absolutely a violation of the essence. So this Schrems 2 litigation got a little bit less on, on this element. But they still said that the fact that there is no redress in the US um, still violates your, um, your right to um, access to justice um, and is a violation of the essence in that respect. So um, if you want to look at the details, the Court of Justice has reacted a little bit to that um, factual difference there. Um, now, as uh, so a large last part of the presentation, I would just um, quickly want to go through kind of the practical consequences of all of this. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of drama, I think, and um, I think uh, that calmed down. It's now the opposite. Now everybody tries to ignore it. But basically what um, the problem is from the, or what the debate now becomes out of this case is this outsourcing situations. So there was a lot of lobbying and, and debate where they said, um, basically you are not gonna be able to work worldwide anymore. All of that is gonna be problematic. Um, that's not, that wasn't the outcome of this case. Um, the outcome was that basically outsourcing to US services is de facto illegal. And if you want to go through different cases and in this outsourcing bubble, you can basically differentiate. And it's, um, I think, important that not everything that um, goes to the US is always illegal. It really depends on the case. But we can easily make a couple of groups of cases. First situation is you transfer data to the US that simply does not contain personal data. You don't even fall under the GDPR, so there is no problem whatsoever. Second situation after this judgment is that there is a so-called necessary transfer, so the Article 49. So if you book your hotel in 
New York or you, I don't know, go online shopping somewhere on the US platform and you buy something there that has to be delivered to Europe, all of these data transfers are necessary under Article 49 and can still happen without any of these um, instruments or a privacy shield or safe harbor. To give you an example, we don't have a, an adequacy decision with Mexico and you can still send emails to Mexico. So this whole drama that the world is gonna break down <laughs> um, was, was just not relevant there. However, if you outsource data to a FISA company, so one of these electronic communication service providers in the US, then you actually do have a problem. And that is a lot of all the online cloud stuff that we do in Europe. So we literally have probably every company have a problem here because as soon as you outsource to Google, to Microsoft, to Amazon, whatever you do, um, or you have a supplier that itself outsources to one of them, you're in this territory where you have um, companies in the US that fall under FISA. What's not talked about that much is outsourcing to FISA companies in Europe. So what a lot of these companies did is um, in a PR stunt to try to pretend that all of that is not a problem, they basically said, oh, you can just have a server in Europe. Now, the reality is that FISA does not have a geographic boundary. So the US law says you basically, let's say you're Microsoft and you have a data center in Ireland. Um, under US law, you have to provide the data as long as you have custody, possession, or control over the data. That's the three magic words, custody, possession, or control. And as long as Microsoft has factual access to their data center in Ireland, which they do right now, um, there's no way that Microsoft can say goodbye NSA, we don't have the data here, I can't provide you with the data. There were attempts to unbundle that. There were attempts where basically the, pro, the, the, uh, the storage in Europe was hosted by someone that had the keys. Um, these solutions are possible, but right now most of these hosted in Europe solutions do not overcome NSA surveillance because um, the US entity still has to provide the data because they have access to that data. Now there is the opposite situation where data is transferred to a normal company in the US. So let's say you're an airline, you're, I don't know, Lufthansa and you have your Lufthansa office somewhere in the US, then that office does not fall under FISA so you can transfer data again. Um, that is in short terms, like the situations that you can go through. Um, there was then the debate about supplementary measures, which is my literally favorite debate in all of this Travis 2 case. So the supplementary measures is actually coming from our own submission. So it was super interesting because we were the only party that has even talked about supplementary measures at the Court of Justice. And what we said is that there may be situations where encryption or other technical measures could overcome US law. And that could happen or could overcome foreign law in general. And that could happen if, for example, data is fully encrypted and therefore the US recipient of data doesn't have possession custody control. So let's say I have absolutely encrypted data that I send to a server in the US, then the owner of that server could say, yes, I have scrambled eggs, but I cannot provide you anything more because I don't have it myself. Such supplementary measures are generally a smart idea. But what the industry did, and especially a lot of these industry lawyers, is to kind of try to fly like a jumbo jet through that little exemption that we put in there. And that is what like the whole legal industry is now trying to widen and widen and widen further. If you look at these supplementary measures, you basically have two types. You have technical ones that kind of go down to zero knowledge idea. So you basically say if the recipient doesn't have the data, it can provide it to the government. That technically works and makes sense. Then there are situations that are more contractual where you basically say you just don't disclose the data, you give information and so on, or you resist if your local government comes along. Now that may work in certain jurisdictions where you are able to resist, but in the US that's not possible. In the US you basically have the problem that the law of that third country overrides these contractual options and therefore they're absolutely irrelevant. Um, there is a paper by the EDBB on that where they basically came out with a couple of scenarios and they basically follow exactly the stuff that I've said before that if the transfer goes to a cloud provider that falls under these laws, it would be a violation of the European fundamental rights. And also if there's remote access in the EU of a server. So you have basically your Amazon server somewhere in let's say Frankfurt where Amazon still has access from the US that would also not be okay. 
However, the whole um, industry in the US came around and tried to kind of sell these supplementary measures. Um, that was a tweet I put out a while ago on Microsoft supplementary measures. And basically they try to resell their very basic product and say it's suddenly a supplementary measure. Um, so for uh, Microsoft, for example, they said their big deal was that they're gonna have damages if your data was actually provided to the NSA. Now, the, Europe, uh, the, the GDPR in Article 82 already provides for damages. That's already part of the law. So it cannot possibly be a supplementary measure that you follow the law in Europe that applies anyways. And it was interesting because their damages, for example, was even put under a bunch of conditions that were not foreseen in the GDPR. So basically they said, we give you contractually less of the damages that you have under the GDPR anyways, and then try to sell you this lesser thing as being a supplementary measure that can overcome NSA surveillance. Um, a lot of that is really, really problematic um, faking of compliance that I can't call differently. Um, I would be really interested if someone of, of the companies that pay millions of euros for these services is going to sue a lot of these companies simply for violation of contract law, etc. Because if you go around in Europe and say your products are fully compliant, all of that is absolutely legal. And a European company, be it a university, a government entity, a private company, invests millions of euros and pays millions of euros for these services that are absolutely not compliant, normal contract law would tell you that you would usually get damages back here. And I think there is a huge potential for all of that um, in, in the coming years. Facebook was basically doing the same thing. There's a list on our website of their supplementary measures that are also absolute bullshit. Um, there's even an, sorry, there's an advent reading where I read out the whole thing from Facebook because of some contract, uh, some legal um, rules. Um, but you can have me read out all of these um, contractual measures for, I think, 20 minutes on, on our website. The most interesting one, the most recent one was Google. They also had supplementary measures that you can read on our website. And one of them was basically that they put out signs and fences around their data center because that apparently somehow deters the NSA. Um, so we made like this picture as a kind of a demonstration about their supplementary measures. And just recently, the last two weeks, we had um, three authorities to come out to on Google Analytics. Um, the Austrian DSB and the European Data Protection Authority has already issued their decision, also available on our website, that um, these supplementary measures are not enough and you cannot use Google Analytics, for example, anymore in Europe legally. Um, the Dutch DPA um, has added some text on their website that goes a bit into that direction, but we don't have a final decision yet. Uh, background of that is we filed 101 complaints on all of that um, after Schrems 2 in all of Europe. So there is cases with each DPA right now that they have to decide on. And um, there is a task force in the background. And it seems that that task force has more or less sided with, with our uh, views on all of that. So it's um, probably time to see more enforcement on all of that in Europe um, on the ground as well. Because the interesting thing is so far, we have about um, 2015 was the Schrems 1 decision. We have about seven years since the Court of Justice has said that all of that is illegal, but no one moves. The European Commission doesn't move. The, Europe, the, American, the American government doesn't move. The European industry doesn't move and the American industry doesn't move because everybody hopes that the other one is gonna move first. So we have this paralysis right now where no one is really implementing the judgments of the Court of Justice, which is extremely interesting. Um, very last slide is, I think um, one important part is usually at NOI, we also try to propose a solution. So usually with every one of our cases, there is a best practice guidance, blah, 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 something of how you can comply. Um, the problem with the data transfers is that this is a political problem. As I had in this slide before, it's a clash on a political level. One jurisdiction wants privacy, the other one wants surveillance. So I think if we want to think about a long-term solution, we basically need to have the same thing as in Europe to say, if we have a common standard for privacy that is independent of citizenship, at least among the Western countries or among the democratic countries, however you want to call it, then we can again have a free flow of data. And I, I would very much advocate for that in the long run to say, okay, we do have a common core usually among democratic countries that there has to be probable cause, that there has to be a judge approving surveillance, these typical elements. And if we could, generally accept that throughout the, 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 the democratic countries, we could again have free flow of data that, that is, is something that we definitely all want. I'm personally a big fan of that. 
Um, and I think that's kind of the direction that in the long run we have to go to. Um, the problem is right now we're not really in a global world that um, goes that direction too much. And especially in the US, the big problem is Congress cannot even pass its own budget. So it's kind of hard to see that they would pass a surveillance reform that, that is uh, beneficial to foreigners. However, I want to mention that they did pass after Snowden a surveillance reform that was useful for um, US citizens at least. So there is the possibility for that. But in the long run, the interesting thing is if global industry is gonna push for that, because if they want to have a global internet, they will need to have these global unified standards. Um, and that is my kind of bigger hope that because of an economic motive, we may have a kind of more joint approach to these surveillance um, systems that are not based on citizenship alone. That was my kind of uh, hopeful little part in the end, because there's not that much other hopeful parts I could actually talk about in this case. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to questions and answers um, for the rest of the time that we have. Thanks. Okay, lot, Max, I will kick off because I've got some questions that have been filed while you speak. I want to start with mine, of course, which is, given the America USA's proclivity for generously exporting democracy all around the world, do you consider the United States of America a democracy? Absolutely. I don't think that there is any de debate about being a democracy. Um, it's, a, it's more of a matter of how we define fundamental rights in this part. And um, to be fair, Europe before the Second World War usually defined fundamental rights based on citizenship as well. And only after the Second World War we moved to human rights. And um, I think that is simply historically a move that the US never made because they're still basically with the original constitution from way back when. And that is where we have the conflict. In the European Union, an American has just much as much of a fundamental right as, 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 in the, in, as, a, as a European citizen, unless the right to vote and these like citizens' rights. Um, and the US hasn't made that move. And I think that is the, 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 the really key point because um, if you look at politics, um, the US has also had the same issues with who or why about surveillance in the US with TikTok about surveillance in the US when it comes from China, where they suddenly said, oh, we don't want our data to go to China either if they surveil us. So the, the, the basic problem is I think uh, a problem off the internet. If, if your rules only protect your own citizens, you can't have a global internet at the same time. So I think that is that is where the issue lies. It's not really a democracy issue in any way. Um, and it's more of an issue that a democracy itself can only represent people that can vote there. And so if my representation in the US is like a US senator that I'm not, never going to vote for in my life, um, I'm simply not represented. That is exactly why you have human rights to represent the people that are not represented probably in, in, a, in, a, um, in a citizen's rights approach. Um, and that is hard to overcome for the US, just in the reality, they're not going to change their constitution tomorrow because of a couple of Europeans. Thank you. Um, Gary Lefebvre asks that, um, do you think that uh, pseudonymization is the most promising supplemental measure for uh, SHRIMS 2 compliance? Um, not really. Pseudonymization is, I think, especially used by the industry a lot to overcome uh, problems that they can't overcome otherwise. Um, if you look at the history of the GDPR, pseudonymization was basically pushed by Alex, uh, Alexander Voss, the German representative for the conservatives, and no one wanted to have pseudonymization in the GDPR. So what they did politically is they added pseudonymization everywhere where it didn't matter. <laughs> so you can find pseudonymization defined in the GDPR, but all the key elements um, of the GDPR, especially the data transfer elements, um, do not mention pseudonymization as a way out. So um, and that's generally a big problem about the GDPR is um, there's a lot of, of wishful thinking in, in especially the professionals that work with the law. Um, and that creates a lot of these problems. Um, one of that is pseudonymization typically. Another one is that the whole GDPR it has a risk-based approach. That was another one of the things that the conservatives wanted to have in the GDPR. The risk-based approach does exist in certain elements. For example, in security, Article 32, um, where it has a place and where it absolutely makes sense. But there is no mention of risk or risk-based approach and a whole chapter on data transfers, for example. And what we see is that the legal industry is taking one concept of the GDPR, 
and kind of transplants it somewhere where they think it fits or it helps them. Um, but it's simply not supported by the law. And um, there is, I think, from a political point of view, an argument for, for a risk-based approach, and it kind of makes sense probably, uh, but it's simply not supported by the law. And, and even the commission takes is very problematic in that because in the new SECs, they kind of blink towards the right to a to risk-based approach, but then also go the curve the other direction. And if you ask the drafters of the new SECs if that should have been interpreted as a risk-based approach, they absolutely tell you no, because they absolutely know if it hits the court of justice, they would be crucified by the court of justice if they would have put a risk-based approach in there. So um, we have the situation where there's an expectation by the industry or rumor within the industry that there is a risk-based approach, the pseudonymization, et cetera. Um, we usually have a very like really positivistic approach to the law. If it's simply not there and you can't possibly argue it, it goes off from, for example, a NOIP table. And that's both ways. Oftentimes also there's just no support for certain privacy interests. So I, that's probably also my legal education in Austria. It's very positivistic. Um, and for a lot of these arguments, I just don't see support in the law at all. Um, Leila Nielsen from Norway asked, even if a customer agrees to use Google Analytics with an anonymous IP address, are they still breaking, are we still breaking EU GDPR rules? So for the anonymization, that was especially a problem because anonymization is done in a second step. So there's still the actual IP address first. So you fall into the GDPR on a first step anyways. Secondly, um, Google uses cookies and, and connects that to the user account. So there is, even if you have no IP address theoretically in the transaction, you would still have the cookie IDs and therefore be able to identify an individual. So this whole anonymization that Google provides is, is just uh, bullshit for a lot of the users that just have a Google account. And as a website owner, you can't differentiate between people that have a Google account or not. But what's more interesting is the question of consent. Now, under Article 49, you can consent to international data transfers. Um, and there is two different views. The one view is that you can consent in individual cases. The other view is that that is actually not supported by the law. And therefore, you can mass consent. You basically can have everybody on your website consent to the data transfer to the US. Um, however, even if that's possible, the consent would have to be a yes or no option, a fair consent, et cetera. Um, I saw one or two websites that started doing that. So they had not just a yes or no button for cookies, but they basically said yes, including transfer to the, to the US or no, no transfer to the US. As long as you can actually push both, both buttons, that may be an argument if you accept that it can be done en masse. There is a lot of data protection authorities that argue you can do that. Um, you basically can only use consent in individual cases and not as a, a general approach, but that is, um, let's say, disputable. I hope that's ah, useful. Yeah. You've answered one of Henrik Paulus's questions, but he had a second one, which was, uh, do we have a list of any standard protocols on what is a technically secure mechanism? Um, not really, because the whole idea of that is an, an independent assessment. And I think that is probably one thing I forgot about to say. The general rule is you have to keep data in the European Union. I know that that's not the reality, but from the law's perspective, the general rule is you're not allowed to use a US provider unless you can make sure that that provider is fully compliant. So it's a huge responsibility as a company to do these assessments. Now, and that is part why I mentioned before that there is this kind of responsibility shifting and no one wants to move first because basically the industry says, please DPAs tell us which one of these solutions is okay or not. Now, there's no way that the DPA can think about every technical possibility <laughs> of your personal data transfers. There is hundreds of encryptions, hundreds of situations. No authority will give you that list. Quite honestly, no law firm will give you that list and actually guarantee that that's 100% certain or safe. And so you basically really have the onus on yourself to do this assessment and the review. Um, for example, on our website, one of the little things as Noib that we could do for our controllers in that side is that we had a, a questionnaire on our website, you can still download it, that you can send to your suppliers and say, do you fall under any of these uh, surveillance laws in the US? So it allows you to um, have an upfront, detailed, precise question if they fall under one of these laws. If they do, they're usually out. That is the assessments you can do. On a technical side, there's a lot of technical magic that is right now sold. Um, 
I haven't seen anything so far that actually overcomes the problem. There is solutions for data that is end-to-end -end encrypted anyway. So let's say my recipient in the US is not an electronic communication service provider, but it just goes through one. And there I have end-to-end -end encryption, then I could possibly argue that there is no realistic way that the NSA would get that data. There's still a lot about um, metadata that could still be used. So let's say I communicate with someone in the US, the metadata still says Max Schrems, then it's still a possible for the NSA to filter out the encrypted data and possibly break the encryption. So you also have to think, is the whole data stream encrypted or just my individual content and body of the transaction? As you can already see from trying to answer this question, it really depends case by case. And um, that's the problem in this whole situation. The only situation other than kind of an end-to-end -end situation that I can think of is if the data is just dead. If it's just backup data that is not processed, then you can possibly ship the encrypted stuff. There's a lot of talk about different keys being held in Europe. Uh, usually these keys then have to be provided for the actual processing operation to um, the, the, US pro, uh, pro, um, the US company again. And that means that at that point, they can copy the key again and, and get it out and provide it to the NSA. So long story short, um, we haven't seen really any technical measures so far that would overcome the problem. I'm more than happy once there is one there to say, woo, we found the solution. Um, just to come back to the UK, Max, uh, Oscar Mento asked, do you think that the UK mass surveillance, which is conducted under the Investigatory Powers Act of 2016 and the UK-US data access agreements, the Cloud Act, pose a continued threat to UK GDPR adequacy decisions issued by the EU? I, I guess so, yes, but I have to uh, put like five asterisks next to that because um, I haven't really reviewed UK surveillance law. My, my head is still spinning from US surveillance law, so I'm quite happy not to have gone into UK surveillance law. But um, if you look at the, there's one argument for the UK, which is there's still the European Convention of Human Rights, which is not available in the US. So there is that baseline guarantee that the UK can put forward that the US cannot put forward right now. However, we all know that the test under the European Convention for Human Rights is rock bottom. The, the two courts, um, basically Luxembourg as the Court of Justice, has a very high bar for, for national surveillance. If you look at data retention and so on, Strasbourg is about rock bottom on all of that. They allow almost anything. So it's hard probably for the Court of Justice to say, oh, actually, if you comply with Strasbourg, we somehow accept that being equivalent to the European Union. So there is that argument that the UK doesn't, that the US doesn't even have. So there's something, um, but I'm not sure if it would win after all, especially if you think of the dynamics. So first of all, it's a very fruitful challenge to UK surveillance. So I would see a UK um, group to say, we wanna challenge UK surveillance. And one avenue to do that is to challenge the data transfers to the EU because thereby we get to the court of justice. Um, so there is a, from a legal strategy that, that could be a realistic scenario. Um, and then the court of justice always wants to say that they are better than Strasbourg. So if the UK comes around with the argument where we're having Strasbourg on our side, it probably is not going to convince judges from a fundamental doctrine that they have, that they have a higher standard than Strasbourg. So um, that would be my two cents that I can post possibly add, again, with my five asterisks that I have not gone into the detail mm -hmm. of UK surveillance mm -hmm. law. Um, I'm going to bounce over to Robin because he may have a question and uh, I think he may want to wind up. Robin? Max, the other day I took myself to the local Amazon store where you go in they watch you and they see what you buy, including picking up a couple of croissants and putting them in a bag, and they've got photographs of everything. And I suppose that may be how it will be everywhere within a few years. And probably the level of street surveillance is going to be greater and greater and face recognition is going to be greater and greater. Isn't some of this just inevitable? Um. Yes and no. I think um, the big question for me is not always if technology comes up, but what it's used for. And I think that is a fundamental, a fundamental possibility that privacy rights give us. So if we have a proper GDPR that is properly enforced and properly followed, I think a lot of that may be less creepy than we think it is today. So if you look at Corona, for example, we have two fractions in the whole Corona surveillance debate. The one thing is to say, 
it's all terrible, it's mass surveillance, we shouldn't have a green pass, we shouldn't have any of that. Um, the alternative view that I'm personally following is to say, if we trust the government, if we trust that the systems are built in a way that they're really just used to make sure that if I enter, I don't know, a theater with a thousand people, I'm not positive, and that is purpose limitation, and it's only used for that purpose, and if anybody uses something for something else, they're going to get a hefty fine, then we may be able to use certain of that technology in a trusted manner and in a way that I don't have to be worried about it 24-7. And I think that is more what we're working on in, in a kind of tech-friendly way, in a way that we actually want to use technology, but to make sure that that technology is to be trusted. And I think that would be a world that's a bit worth fighting for. I'm not a big fan for like, let's go back to the cave and get back to our landline um, because that's not really how, how I see the future, but also not in a way that, you know, there's, I don't know, let's say five big companies after all, because we have huge monopolies that then control vast parts of our information age. And I think if we, if I can kind of sum that up real quick, what I oftentimes try to explain is if we move on to an information age, a bit like how we move, we had capitalism before and we said, you know, who has the money is, is ruling. Um, if we now move to an information age, basically whoever has the most information is going to be ruling the world. <laughs> and, um, and then the big question is how we can regulate. And we're at the very beginning of this. I, I, mm. I usually call the GDPR the least stupid law we had so far. <laughs> um, but we're, it's a bit like the beginning of, 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 um, of, of industrialization right now. We're at the very beginning on all of that historically. Um, and if we have laws and regulations that make sure that for example, we get a bit of information triple down, which is the right to access your Freedom of Information Act, these things. We can build transparency in one direction. Um, mm -hmm. The debate about transparency and algorithms and so on that is just literally starting right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other direction, we have the right to privacy to somehow shield what information goes up and, and what it's allowed to be used for. Then we may be able to come to a balance where, where it works for mankind to, to actually be in such a fully digital world. And I think the, this, this is kind of the debate we're having right now. And we're, again, very much at the beginning, but oftentimes compare that to workers' rights, to consumers' rights, and so mm -hmm. on. That only became a thing, let's say, 150 years ago, when we suddenly had mass working situations, when we had these issues. And the interesting thing is we're not done with this debate until the very day. We're still debating today about what, you know, zero hour contracts in the UK and, you know, all kind of these questions. Um, and we're probably going to have that debate for as long as there is information age. And, and I think that's the reason why this, this area is so interesting and why, why also studying it and working in that area is extremely interesting. And it's also part of the reason why we work on it, because um, if we give it up now, that would be a bit early. <laughs> and, and I'm still hoping that we're going to move to a world where that works somehow well. Well, it's a bit like, you know, it's much easier to relinquish your intellectual property than to get it back again. And, you know, once you've relinquished anonymity, same kind of tough call. Yeah. Over to Robin. Well, there we go. I think it's probably time for me to say thank you so much, Max. And to say to our audience, let it be on your conscience forever if you don't send him a sub. You're going to get an email <laughs> to making it very easy how to do it. Uh, he agreed to do it for nothing. Uh, he is really one of the remarkable people in Europe and indeed in the world. Thanks Back. a lot for that. I may also want to add that at Noib, I'm also working for free. I'm the only volunteer that we have there. <laughs> but we have a team of 20 people by now that is, is hopefully going to build on all of that much more and we're always happy if there is input um support feedback whatever you have thanks okay. good, good night all good, good night, night everybody all.